What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here at GSD Studios. First off, thank you so much for checking out today's content. I'll make this extremely fast, but I need to plug our sponsors that make this show possible. Our first sponsor is PerfectStormNow.com, by far the most effective and affordable real estate agent website and database platform in the industry. It is the system I use to sell 50 plus homes every single month. Check it out at www.perfectstormnow.com. Our second sponsor is my personal real estate agent mentorship program, www.90daymastery.com. Get the entire program for only $997 with promo code LIVEMASTERY. All caps, all one word, all together. Learn more at www.90daymastery.com. See what the program is all about. See live testimonials, how real estate agents have changed their life. All right, you guys, let's dive on into today's content. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD mode interview where every single week we interview top entrepreneurs and strip top badasses. They're out there dominating their spaces. They're people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, uh, big amazing, epic lives for themselves and their families, as well as have a big, large impact on others while they exist here on this planet. So today, you guys, got a very special guest on the show, um, a guy that I've known for, for a lot of years now. We actually uh, won the 30 under 30, NAR's 30 under 30 years ago together. Um, was an extremely successful real estate agent, um, is now a, a really serial entrepreneur, a lot of different ventures. He's uh, the owner of uh, Skyslope, which is a real estate management software um, system that's really taken off. So stoked and honored to have Tyler Smith on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Yeah, real uh, real pumped to be here. It brings back to our old days in Chi-Town, Chicago. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm stoked, dude, man. I mean, it's been a lot of years since we've talked. And uh, um, it, it, it's weird, man, because I've actually been um, – a sky school, you know, sky so slow client for years. And I didn't know that you were the owner until like a year ago. You know? <laughs> I'm like, holy crap, dude, I get such a small world and it just, all this stuff works, man. So, you know, really stoked to, to get into and talk about, uh, you know, how all this transpired. But before, man, I'm always intrigued in our guest journeys that really led them into entrepreneurship and you know, what really led you to, to real estate entrepreneurship in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I got into, you know, first off, I was 19 years old and, and any 19 year old, one, you don't want to live with your parents anymore. Right. And number one, and number two, you're like, you want to pick up chicks. That was my 19 year old vision. And so uh, I was like, real simple, mom, I love you, dad, but I'm going to go buy a house and I'm 32 now or 33 now. And so obviously this was in 2005 and the market was doing well, subprime mortgages, um, pretty much if you can fog a mirror, you can get a loan. And so they loaned me and my best friend, um, you know, almost $300,000 at the age of 19. And so I bought a house and I was a server at the time. And what was crazy was uh, my realtor sucked, you know. So the day I moved in, my hot water heater was busted. Um, I didn't know anything about a home inspection, which I didn't get. I didn't get a home warranty. I knew nothing. And uh, I said, if she can make $13,000, and do a bad job, like this is, this is a no brainer. Like I know I can do a better job. And, and when you're 19, $13,000, you're a millionaire, right? And so you can do a whole lot of things. So I said, uh, mom, dad, I'm dropping out of college. I'll, I'll figure out how to pay you back some other time, but I'm gonna get into this, this new career called real estate, right? Um, and I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, I'm gonna sell for myself. And mom, I don't have to have a boss because I hate having a boss. And she said, good luck, uh, you know, you're, you're probably going to, uh, to, to fail. And so that's really what got me into real estate was my, my bad experience with a realtor, you know? And so from there, it kind of just uh, trickled downwards, unfortunately. I, uh, I got in, I got business cards. I, uh, I, I tried to grow out a mustache and a beard because when you're 19 or 20, you look like you're 12. <laughs> and so uh, I didn't even know how to tie a double Windsor. I remember like, how do you tie a double Windsor? And I had to look good for my photo. And uh, my idea was of prospecting back then was put as many business cards anywhere you can and someone's gonna pick one up and call you and wanna buy a house. Well, that was a really big rude awakening because that was not what happened. <laughs> and you actually had to produce and you actually had to you know, put things in place and go out there and get the business. And so uh, I think I sold like two homes my first year. Not, not a great start. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I, I, I meet so many realtors that, that jump in the space for the exact same reason. You know, they, they observe the experience. 
they, they had a negative experience. They, they know they can do it better and they jump in and, and a lot of them have that mentality of business is going to come to me. Right. Um, um, which we all know is not necessarily the case. Um, and, and we're also in an industry where 90% of realtors fail in the first three years. And, and I mean, it's, it's a tough space, man. So what did you do? I know you, you talked about it being a struggle. You, you, you only sold two homes, but now you got obligations. You got housing. I mean, they are yeah. 19, you probably don't have a family yet, you know, or any of that, but you still have bills. And you know, yeah. so then what did you, from that place where you're struggling, how then do you go out there and start creating success early on so you didn't become another one of those statistics? Yeah, so a couple of reasons, uh, a couple of things. Number one, I'm the kind of person with, with, with pressure, I just do very well. So first thing was I said, okay, well, I closed two transactions. I'm a big uh, believer in reflecting on the previous year and understanding what the pros were, what the cons were. And I said, one, I can't be doing paperwork because I'm so excited about the deal, right? You have to think, I'm 20 now, set, put a house under contract. And I'm so excited about the deal that I just focus on that deal. And then it closes and then I have no other people to work with, right? And so I said, one, I sold two homes. It was great. I thought I was on top of the world. My first house was like a $500,000 home. I made 15 grand. I spent 10 grand within a month, right? And I still felt like I was rich. So a year later, I said, two things have to happen. One, I can't be romantic and focused on the transaction. I have to be focused on prospecting. Number two, I'm gonna hire an assistant. And so everyone says, you're crazy. You're not making money. How are you gonna hire an assistant? And this gal who now still works for me at Skyslope, uh, who, who's phenomenal, 11 years later, she took a chance and she says, I don't want you to ever lay me off and I want you, I want to work with you for a very long time. And so that being that young, having that type of pressure, I was like, I, I got to be prospecting. So I said to her day one, I said, hey, remove my desk. I don't need a desk. If I'm at the desk, I'm not doing what I should be doing. I need to be out. Um, and, and meeting belly to belly with clients and prospecting and whole open houses. Like I am not going to have a desk moving forward. And for a full, I think like 16, 17 months, I had no desk. And so that was my, I think my biggest driver. Um, number one, number two is accountability. I, I'm a dude. I was a knucklehead at 20. So I, I couldn't listen to my mom and dad. Right. Cause at that age you don't, I didn't listen to anyone, but I was a, a dog on a bone. It came to information and being the best. And I was competitive. I ran uh, track and field and I was really good and I always was, wanted to be number one in real estate so I said well if you look at like Kobe LeBron whoever they've got coaches so I need to get a coach and so I, I got a coach I said here's my expectations here's your expectations let's roll and from there it really was like uh, game changing I mean my numbers I think the next year I sold over 17 or 18 homes and from there it went up and up and up probably selling over 300 homes over three years in a row built a team which was building around a thousand units a year based on you know coaching accountability processes systems and uh and, and just hunger yeah love it dude so so okay so you you hire this assistant you hire this coach um now you get the, the pressures on dude because now you got big obligations it's not about just you you know at this point now um and, and you're pounding the payment of prospecting but like what were you doing at that point to go out there and prospect and generate that business um you know to, to start catapulting your career yeah, so I looked at business. I had something called like a like a flow chart type of deal. I broke it into three different sections. One was a marketing pillar. One was an operations pillar. Who does what? And then one was a finance. Right? How many homes do I want to sell? Um, what's my average commission? What are my average expenses? What is my net going to be after taxes? So it was marketing, operations, and finance. And so uh, your question was all all based around marketing, right? What was I going to do? So one of them was obviously my, my database, right? I mean, I didn't have a database. So the first thing was I need to build a database. And so being 20, what are you gonna do? Call your buddies and be like, hey dude, you wanna buy or sell a home? Like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm barely making it in college, right? I'm like, okay, so let me call your parents. Really, they're gonna not use Tyler as their realtor to sell their half a million dollar home, their largest single financial investment. So I had to kind of completely re-engineer, re uh, reverse engineer what my thought process was. So I said, okay, one of my pillars is gonna be out and about on new things. And I'm gonna learn new things, so I'm always about learning, and I'm gonna meet people doing it. So I joined meetup.com, simple, easy site, and I joined like four meetups. One of them was wine, and I said, I don't know anything about wine, but it seems like, at the time, rich people drink wine, so I should know about wine, right? And then think about it, I'm 20, 21, I don't know. So I went into uh, this restaurant, and I said, hey, I wanna have a wine meetup here. I'm gonna start a group. 
would you sponsor some wine? Sure. And right away, I got like 150 people who wanted to RSVP. It could only save and hold 30. So we had 30 come. They actually paid me at the door 10 bucks, right? And so I actually made money because the event was free and the guy wanted his restaurant to get advertising. And so uh, I met people. I learned about wine, which I had never even had a glass of wine at that, that age. Um, I, a lot of young people at 20, 21, they're not really drinking wine. And you remember your 20, when you were 20 or 21. So I learned about wine. I met people. I said, hey, guys, I'm Tyler. I'm, I'm a realtor. And I wanted to learn about wine. I want to start this. And so that was one of my pillars. And I had others, right? Um, that was just wine. But I had four different meetups that, that how, is how I built my database. And so a lot of my clients weren't young. They were older because I, I, I went out to the older um, crowds, wine and, and different hobbies. So one of them was getting out, marketing. Um, the second one was business people. Um, you know, I, I learned early on that business owners are usually held to a higher standard than just a, a typical consumer. Um, they usually make more money, hopefully, right? But business owners know other business owners. And I wanna be known to have a really great business network, whether it be plumbers, painters, attorneys, financial advisors, all the way to maids, right? I mean, anything you can think of, I wanna do this. So I don't know if it's still around. You remember like B&I and T&I, and remember those groups? Yeah. I said, I'm not gonna pay to do this. It seems really weird. I'm gonna create my own network of the best business people and we're gonna meet on a quarterly basis and I'm gonna do happy hour. And um, it started with five people. And so everyone goes, well, how'd you get it? At one point it was 120 people that we had to do two groups. I'm like, well, how'd you get it to 120? It's like, well, I started with five guys. I started with very simple. I said, this is the vision for it. This is what I'm trying to do. Who do you know that would provide value and do business like I do, which is all by referral, right? And so um, enough, that was business. The third was obviously family and, and personal friends, which is a very small portion of my business. Um, and from there, I created these pillars. That's how I got started. Um, then what I did was I went out to builders. So builders was one of mine. I went and met with all the builders and told them I'd like to actually sell their, their, their homes. And if not, I'd like to represent people who have contingencies. And I just got in. No, I, my goal was, again, to be outside of the office. If I'm in the office, it's a dying business. And so I was always out belly to belly. If I was going to have lunch, my theory was I'm having lunch with somebody or I, I don't eat. I'm never eating alone. And I read a book, I think it was called Never Eat Alone. Yeah. Um, and it was, I'm not going to eat alone. And there were days where I didn't eat because guess what? I, I made a pact to myself and said, if I'm not going to actually have a very valuable lunch, then I am not, in my eyes, and this is back when Tyler was 21, 22, I'm not hard enough and I'm, I'm, I'm a baby. And so I'm not going to eat, right? And so that was kind of my, uh, my, my, my MO. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love it, man. It's brilliant, dude. So when, when you, when you, let's just kind of hone in, let's just say the wine club, for an example, yeah. that started, you know, okay, you get all these people coming in there. Yeah. Um, you, I'm sure you're having a strategic way to collect their information to get them in your database. But then it's like people are joining this to drink wine and learn about wine, not necessarily to be spammed and, and pounded with real estate information. Like how, how did you bridge the two so you could add value, not annoy them, not get them to, to want to get the hell out, but then also be aware that Tyler Smith is this real estate agent. Great question. So and this, I think it's a, a really good question because I went in with zero expectations. You have to think, I don't know anything about wine. I don't know. I'm like, I thought people who drank wine were like old fat people that just had a lot of money. Like that was my, like that was my vision. Right. And I like wine now. That was my vision then. Cause I had no idea. My mom didn't drink wine. My dad didn't drink wine. They drank other type of drinks. So I'm like, I thought old, fat, rich. That's all I thought. And so I had no expectations of, I might meet like, you know, elderly people. I don't know. I had no idea. So I went there and I said, guys, here's the vision for this group. I'm young. I know that I'm the youngest one in the room, but guess what? I want to learn about wine. I don't know anything about it. I don't know reds, whites. I don't know Merlots, Merlots, Chandon. I don't know any of these guys. I don't know anything about wine, and I'm just here to learn. So I went in with, I want to learn. I didn't go, I'm going to go here and get tons of business. I thought that, but I said, I'm going to take the first meeting and just learn. And so I learned about wine. So you have to think, people who like wine want to talk to people who don't know anything about wine, about wine. And so what happens is you get in conversation. So I'm not like, guys, use me. I'm the realtor. I want you guys to come drink wine, and you need to use and buy, buy homes with me. It wasn't that. It was, hey, so Josh, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm in, you know, I'm in this and that. Tyler, what do you do? Oh, I'm in real estate. I'm a realtor. Oh, yeah, I'm a realtor. How's the market? So people get talking, right? Now, the first meeting was, I'm just going to tell them what I do if they ask. I'm going to be in, 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 
invested in knowing what they do and seeing what we want to set for the future of this because I knew I had a lot of interest. So that was the first step. From there, I started to ask questions and people got to know me. So one, I was the organizer, so that helped, right? Everyone wants to know who the organizer is and their background. Number two was I'd get their advice. So maybe at a next wine meetup or inside the chat forum, I'd say, hey guys, I got a question. I'm thinking about throwing my clients a housewarming party. I'm just curious, what would you think if you were using Tyler and he gave you a housewarming party? So I'm not asking for the business, right? I'm looking for advice. So what it is is, okay, yeah, I think that'd be great. No, I don't think so. And then they go, okay, great. What about wines? I was thinking about doing a blind tasting for my client in El Dorado Hills for their housewarming party. I'm gonna bring in five or six wines, do blind tasting for their guests for the house. So now I'm, I'm incorporating wine into what I call a piece of my value proposition. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so from there, I just built relationships. Now what's crazy, because I always tell people, within two months of being in this wine group, I got a lead, I put them in contract, and literally 90 days later, I had them close. And so people are like, oh, Tyler, I'm gonna join a meetup, I'm gonna do it. That's probably not normal, right? Um, I got lucky, but I will tell you, one of my biggest pillars of business was the wine meetup group because I stayed in it. And I didn't see it start to churn until probably year after year one, you know, probably 13, 14 months, but I built rapport. I knew everyone in there. I knew their name. I would talk with them. I'd ask them a question. Hey, Josh, if you're buying or selling a home, you know, who, who's your realtor you go to? Who's your go-to? I'm just curious. And when they said, I don't have one or, nah, I don't remember their name. I was like, I want to be that guy. You know, you know me from wine. I want to be that guy. But I wasn't saying that day one. I'd get to know them. I'd understand them. And then when I felt comfortable, I'd ask them that question. Hey, who's your go-to realtor? I'm just curious. And from there, I would start doing things to them from, <clears throat> from getting them something on a monthly basis, emailing them on a monthly basis, calling them. Any type of wine I taste, I'd take a photo. I'd send it. Hey, I just had this wine. It's great. I would be also engaging all the time with these people, um, just like a CRM, right? And so I stayed in contact in a big way. I tell realtors today, if I was selling real estate in today's market, it would be dumb. Like I would, it would, it wouldn't even, it would be so easy because of all the leveraging that you have with technology that I didn't have back then. Right? Like text message was available back then, but it wasn't like the end all be all. You know what I mean? Like a voice note saying, Hey Josh, I know it's your birthday. Just want to say happy birthday. I hope you're having a great day. Bye. And being able to leave a voice note so they can connect me or a video. That wasn't existing back then. And so if I was able to be in real estate today with what's available, it would be, it would be dumb. Like literally it would be, it would be dumb. Yeah. Love it, dude. So then, all right. So, so you're, you're, you're going, you got these pillars, um, you're growing your business, you know, you're, you, you went from two homes to, you know, 20 ish homes or whatever that number was. And then, you know, you, you transition from there into, to this mega agent doing 300 deals year after year. Um, which at that point, um, you know, I mean, it's tough to scale a business that way, right? Because then it's so much about systems, processes, people, um, like how, how does that transition? How do you go from you know, 20 homes a year due to 300? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, so first off, I didn't have a plan, but I, after a, a, some time doing it, I, I figured out a plan in the beginning. It was, I was getting referrals. I, I can tell you, I was getting on average 35 referrals month over month for over 18 months straight on average, 18 months straight. That's not like this month I got 35, next month I got three. No, on average for 18 months straight, 35 referrals. Now, these aren't leads, these aren't referrals. Like, hey Tyler, my mom, she needs a house like now. Can you call her and take care of her? Yes. And so I was getting a lot of referrals. So one, it was, how do you scale it is, number one, I tracked everything, very first. So I had a lead tracker or a lead sheet, and I would go in there and put any referral or any lead or anything that happened. And I put how many times I contacted them. I lived in this book, right? And my lender at the time taught me this. So I lived in this book for that. Anytime something closed, I'd put it in there. Here's what I made. Here's what my commission was. So I knew my numbers very well. So knowing that, how was I able to go from 10, 15 homes a year to 37, which was the next year? So one, I delegate everything to my assistant. So my number one responsibilities, which goes back to the flow chart is marketing pillars, right? Operations is who does what? So at the time it was me, Jennifer, and a transaction coordinator. And it was very clear, Tyler is helping people buy homes, Tyler's helping people sell homes, 
um, and Tyler's cashing checks. That's it. Everything else you have to figure out. And that's, that was our agreement. You're going to figure everything else out. So for the marketing, for making sure when my client comes in, I know that she has a daughter that's three and I'm giving you know, her a Barbie doll for her. Like she had all of that set up for scale. And so I was only in charge of helping people buy, helping people sell. And, and I say cash and checks just because it's a mental thing for me, but it was really helping people buy and sell. Now at one point, the third year, I realized I can't show everybody homes. Like this is just not going to work. This is not time. This is not great for time. People want to buy homes. And the biggest challenge for me was to get over my own ego because guess what? At the time I thought, well, no one can do it as good as Tyler. I'm, I'm better. I don't, I'm a control freak. I don't want to let somebody represent my buyer. And so I had a real co big conversation with myself, my coach and my assistant. And she's like, I'm telling you right now, they don't need, you're good, but they don't need an A plus. They can do very well and find a home with the B, right? So I, you don't need another Tyler. And by the way, if we find another Tyler, they're not going to save you anyway, right? They're, they're going to leave. So we need to find someone who says, I like to get fed business, that type of personality. I'm loyal, right? And I really care about the client. And just as much as Tyler does. And so that's the profile we went out. We found somebody, brought on my first buyer's agent and said, you're responsible for all the buyers. So now you have to think, I had good leads coming in, but I was known as the listing guy. I had some buyer leads, but now I'm like, okay, I've got to actually produce for this person now, right? I told them I'm going to have leads. They're in charge of prospecting as well, but I'm not giving them some crazy split. I was getting 50-50 in the beginning. So why would they ever want to be under my team? Well, because I'm giving them leads and that's the type of profile we pick. So now I'm trying to generate buyer leads as much as I can as well to feed into my first buyer's agent. And so I, I think the long ended question here is how do I scale it is putting systems in place. And so uh, I established something early on where I, I, I had a list and it started with one item. And I said, if we're going to really build a business by referral and create a walking, talking billboard, we need to wow our clients. It's kind of like uh, Think about like you go to a great hotel and you have a phenomenal experience and you're just like, like I want to go back and I want to tell everyone about how great it was. You know, um, that's what we wanted to create inside the real estate space. And so we did things from delivering pizza on moving day, right, to throwing housewarming parties for the client. Um, when they got approved, myself and the lender would drop off a small bottle of champagne with balloons at their office because we knew that one, they'd feel good, but two, everyone's gonna be nosy and go, what are the 10 balloons in a bottle of champagne? Oh, this is for my lender and realtor. We got approved for a loan and the best time, this is what I tell people, the best time to receive a referral. And still today, if you look at the stats, NAR came out that 50% of deals are still by referral. So there's still a big market for referrals, but when you think about it, if, you're, if you really wanna build up a business, how do you really get referrals or get people to think and talk about you? The best time to do it is during the process. That's the most active that they are when they're going to refer you. Kind of like when you're buying a car. If you're going to buy, I don't know, a new Lexus, you start to see Lexus is everywhere. Me telling you right now the word Lexus, you're going to be driving it and you're going to see Lexus is just by me saying the word Lexus. It's just, it's called the reticular activator. It's what happens. And so the best time to receive a referral or to get people to talk about you as a realtor is during the process. And so the biggest mistake people make is they, they give presence after it closes. And it's like, well, hey, dude, you just gave a referral. You, you got a commission check. You're giving them a present now only because you got paid. How do you think, how do you think they feel? So when someone gave me a referral, I'd give them a gift card to Starbucks. It went out. Even if it was a referral to a deal I knew would never close in a mobile home. Right? Like it's going out. I can't thank you enough. You have no idea. And that's still, what's crazy is people are like, well, we're in a digital world now, Tyler. That doesn't work. And no, it still works today. I'm telling you, I'm, I see people do it today and still get business. So I had systems in place that I did 35 things for every buyer and every single seller from the moment I shook their hand, gosh, all the way till it closed and post closing. Yeah. Love it, man. Love it. So then, you know, a lot of, a lot of agents that I, I know are, are very high and I mean, a very big chunk of their business is through referrals. They, they, it's hard enough to delegate, you know, right. But then it's a lot easier to delegate. Hey, if I'm just getting these new Facebook leads that don't have a relationship with me and, and you know, their first point of contact might be the agent on my team. Um, how, I mean, did you have some of those kind of limiting beliefs that were going on? And if so, um, you know, how, how, how did you educate that, that consumer? So then they weren't expecting to work with Tyler and, and have success with that. Great question. So I'll give you, I'll break this down into two phases. Um, so one, I had a very big business network. As I said, it was one of my pillars. It was what I focused on. Everyone that was in my business network, we had an agreement. 
here's the deal. Josh, let's say you're, the, you're my lender, okay? And I'm the realtor. I say, Josh, I'm going to do business with you. But here's what I need. You and I are going to play off each other. So when my buyer is sitting down with you getting pre-approved, you're going to talk great about me because you do believe I'm great. And I'm going to always talk great about you. For example, so you sit down with my lender. Let's just say Evangeline Scotch. But hey, Josh, you're working with Tyler, one of the top realtors I work with. You're in great hands. Um, you're going to love working with him. And you know what? His team, Denise, you're going to love. Denise is his, his, his number one buyer's agent. You are going to love her. She represents all his buyers. And when we pre-approve you, she's going to love working with you. I, I can't wait to tell her about you. So it started there. You follow me? It started there with the lender. Now, obviously, if, if it's not a lender you have a relationship with, good luck. That's not going to happen. But I highly suggested, and I really pushed, hey, Josh, I know that you have your own lender. You lose nothing by getting pre-approved my lender here. And regardless if you go there or not, just to get a second opinion, their company is going to give you a $100 gift card. So you, you lose nothing. And most of the time, she won the business over because of the relationship, because of my endorsement, and because it, she beat the rate, right? And so, one, it started with the lender. Second thing was when somebody wanted to uh, said, hey, Tyler, I can't wait to buy a home with you. Let's go looking. I said, great. We have a process. Jennifer's going to call you. She's going to schedule it, my assistant, and we're going to meet. And so what would happen was we would set that up. Hey, Denise is, this is Denise. She's my buyer's agent. Um, she represents all my buyers. So I didn't say like I pick and choose. It was she represents all my buyers. And sometimes they'd say, well, well Tyler, you know, and my, my own mother, I did not represent. I gave them to Denise. So I said, mom, I, I'm telling you, she's active. She, she actually is going to represent you better. Not on the personal touch feeling, but she's out in the field. She represents buyers all day long. She's the buyer queen, right? She knows all the agents and she knows even pocket listings. She is the person you want to use. She's going to give you the best service. And trust me, I'm going to be along the entire way and I'm going to be talking to you. So I'm not passing you off. She's just going to show you property. So that is the second part of this. And then the third part, Josh, is what we did was when that happened, I would do check-in calls and there was a script that Denise would use. So if Denise was showing me this property, she's like, hey, take a look at this beautiful pool. Now I talked to Tyler about this pool. He thought it would be great because I know that's what you're looking for, for your, your wife and your blah, blah, blah. So she was incorporating my name into things. So they felt like the entire time they were working with Tyler, although they were working with Denise. And I'd be calling them too. So every Tuesday, I called every single person. And that was Tuesday. It was eight hours of just calling people. And you have to think, they're closing a lot of units. I'm just making a lot of calls. Four and a half, five hours was just making calls, leaving voicemails. Hey, Josh. Real excited. Denise says you guys are looking at property on Elmer Street and Johnson Street. She says you're looking for the one with the pool. Hey, I'm personally going to put a personal call into the list agent to try to get this accepted. I have a relationship with them. So we really work the team aspect like that. But the answer to your question is expectations, right? So many times what happens is you pass it off and there's no expectations. I had a very clear expectation with my lender and all my other business people. I had a very clear expectation with my buyer's agent. My, my assistant, and then I had expectations as well as I'm going to call this person. I'm going to write them a personal note, thanks for trusting myself and Denise. I'm going to call them and make sure, guess what, if I can show up at the signing, because sometimes I had time, I'd show up and surprise them. There, there were certain things I did, but they knew very clear, based on the service and the experience, they were getting top notch agents. And most of the time, I'd only talk to them three or four times throughout the transaction, just checking in, hope all is well, blah, blah, blah. Looks like we're, we're moving right along. Here's where we are. Here's what's happening. Here's a problem I see that we're fixing. My team's on it just to want to reassure you. And these sometimes are we're, we're, we're referrals to, you know, eight, nine million dollar properties. So it can be done. I had to get over the ego, right? Because I did realize I, I'm, I'm, I have a ceiling that I have to handle it all. I think that's the biggest problem that realtors make. I tell people all the time real estate's the best. I literally think it's one of the best businesses in the new world to be in because you truly have no ceiling on your income and you can make, I mean, dumb money. And I don't think they understand. It was always, when I was in real estate, it was, I want to get to hundred grand. I can't wait to get hundred grand. And you get there, you're like, God damn, that was easy. And you're like, okay, I want to get to 250. And it, like, it's crazy how many realtors out there don't realize that they can make a million bucks in a year. And it is feasible. It is not a, oh, well, I don't know. No, it's actually reality. You can make more than that, but it is a true reality. You can make real money like that. And so you will never do that if you can't get over the fact that you need a team. You need to put these processes in place. You need to have expectations, high expectations on both sides. 
this is what I expect from you, this is what you can expect from me, and here it is. Um, and I think that's the biggest limitation for, for realtors. They, they, they think they can do it better, and they think they know it all. And I, I know that because that's what I thought, and I had to have a serious conversation myself. And, I mean, you know, you have a team. You know, it's what you think, right? You probably thought, oh, you know, this person wants to buy, and I kind of, I'm dipping in and out, and I'm pulled, and I don't want to lose the deal, and it's all about expectations. And what's crazy is these buyers, they didn't care. They actually did. They actually did like Denise better because she was more patient. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like she was more patient than I was. Like she actually was what I was selling. She was actually better than what I sold to them because she was more patient. She she had patience with the realtors on the listing side. You know, she could go to the inspections and deal with the problems. She was better at putting out fires than I was when the fence would fall down a day before escrow. She was better than that, right? So it, I think it goes back to expectations and, and building a team that, that's fully bought in. My team was bought in because they knew I'm, I put these things in place and I'm out there doing it myself and I'm generating a big amount of referrals and business. They can go off and do it on their own or they can be in my world of this real estate world and we can actually all make really good money together. And, uh, and that's how I did it, yeah. Yeah. Love it, dude. So then, you know, okay, so you got all these systems, you got these processes in place, you've, you, you've, you know, done a great job of building those out, um, you know, but I, as you keep growing this, dude, you know, I'm just sitting there thinking about that day's worth of calls, you, you, you got to hit to a threshold where at some point, some of that stuff has to be delegated. I mean, it, able then to transition out of the networking groups and doing those calls and transitioning somebody into that space that was able to, to really duplicate what you did. Yeah, so before, so when I had the idea um, uh, to, to start Skyslope and I, I had two businesses, that year before, before I even started Skyslope, I'd be at a place in Tahoe, I'd be there for two months out of the summer. I literally would not come back to Sacramento. So Sacramento's an hour and a half from Tahoe, I'd be in Tahoe. So absolutely, if I'm not there for two months and business is running and we're talking like closing 40 deals that month and I'm gone the entire month, you have to be able to delegate. So what I do is eventually it starts with expectations. Eventually I had to get out of the four, five, six hour days of calling on Tuesdays, right? I knew it was a value prop. I knew there was value there. So what I'd say is set up expectations. Hey Josh, you can expect a call from my assistant Jennifer every single Tuesday. Every Tuesday she's gonna call you and set you up. And so I set the expectations. What's crazy is the moment you set, like everyone's afraid to tell their clients this and I over communicated, set the expectation, and it worked. And I think that's what people have fear of, of like, oh, if I do this, they're gonna leave me. And it's like, no, as long as you set the expectation and you over communicate, the problem is realtors don't communicate, right? And the clients always reach out to them, what's going on, what's going on? We over communicate it. Sometimes they'd be like, I'm okay with talking every other week. Cool, hey, no problem. We just wanna make sure we're there for you. We're okay with that. We'd rather lean on the edge of over communication than under communication. I think that's where sellers and buyers not only get upset, but they, they don't see the value in, in realtors in general. And so what we did was, was Tuesday calls, eventually my staff, Jennifer and Annette did them. So number one. Number two, I got a listing coordinator because I can't go on every listing appointment. And that was really tough. That was a really hard transition because they wanted Tyler, right? And I was good at listing presentations. And I knew how to, to handle objections and negotiations. And I knew what needed to be done. So I took a great, uh, a great uh, guy, put him as my listing coordinator. I said, you're gonna be the new me, and I need you to scale Tyler, right? And here's what we're gonna do, and we did mock trials, and I'd say, I wanna do, I want to list it for 4%, not six. Now, we went through for over a year, going through this, and him going on every listing presentation with me, until he finally started to do it himself, and I saw that he did it, and then I'd step away, and then he started to say, hey, Josh, Tyler, Tyler is real excited. Um, you know, he, he, he would, he's so excited that we're, we're, we're giving the opportunity to list this house. And so I would call them before, hey, Josh, you know, uh, Adam's going to come. He's super, I mean, it was just a communication. Eventually I got out of that and Jennifer, my assistant, started doing it. So um, what it is, is you have to start somewhere. And so I think if you look at it, you start with, I have too much business and I want to grow. I have a goal. If I want to do that, I need to bring on help. Okay, I need to hire an assistant or a transaction coordinator. Great. You build up, you build up, you have less time to, to do things. Great. You need to bring, bring on your second hire. Who is it? it's going to be a, a buyer's agent. Now the biggest problem is, are you going to be able to keep that buyer's agent busy, right? Once they, once you actually give the business to them, the big question it, realtors say is, well, what am I going to do now? 
Well, you're going to go out there and double up on your prospecting or triple up on it. That's where people fail is they want the Tyler 300 deals a year, single practitioner all the way to a thousand deals a year with the team, but they don't want to do the work. They just want to let everything happen and the checks just come in. You got to do the work. You got to put the work in. You know, you, you, you got to actually put these processes in place and you got to show your team that guys, if I'm going to go, whether it be knocking doors or if I'm going to go, you know, wrap a bow on somebody's door because they're closing tomorrow. If I'm going to do this, you're going to do this. And so when I, every time I hired someone, I took more work off my plate and I doubled up my, my, my prospecting uh, abilities until eventually enough business came in and my team were doing these items. The, the way that we kept the business going without me in it, Joshua, was, was my, my 35 items that I did on every buyer and every seller. Every, we had to do it. So this is what would happen. We get a piece of paper like this. And at the end of it, when it was closed, my assistant would have to sign off that all 35 items are done. If they weren't, I got a 15% difference in the buyer's agent or the listing coordinator's commission. So if they were at a 50-50 split, I now got 15% more if they did not do all 35 items. And it wasn't because I wanted that money. I needed it to hurt enough to where they would not make that mistake because we did know that this was the promised land of getting and continuing this business. And it was. I mean, we're generating 35 referrals every month, month over month of people who are buying. I don't know if someone who's generating five referrals on a month, you know, and what happens is they go to the quick fix, right? Which I'm not saying Facebook leads or Zillow leads are bad. That's one marketing pillar, right? Maybe the meetup groups is another marketing pillar. Maybe business network is another one. Maybe, um, you know, uh, referrals is one, but I'm telling you right now for me and Zillow leads, those things weren't around when I was, when I was doing it. So guess what? For me, it was, here's my pillars of business builder businesses, personal referrals and friends and family, and then my sphere and then my meetups. Those are my pillars. The problem is it's easy to receive leads and pay. It's simple. It's real easy for me to actually pay for leads, whether it be through a, plat a portal or whether it be to pay somebody to market me on Facebook and get the leads. The hard part is incubating it and providing value, right? And so that's what I was really good at is providing the value to scale. And so those 35 items they had to do on every single buyer, every single seller, or I got paid more. And then eventually we just got rid of them if they didn't believe it. Yeah, yeah, love it. I mean, so, I mean, essentially you're just, you, you, you got these system processes dialed in. Now you're, you're delegating out tasks. You just keep duplicating at a bigger scale what created the success for you in the first place. And then you get to a point where, um, like, I mean, how, how did Skyslope, I mean, how, how did this idea even come up in your head? Was it to solve one of your own problems internally or, or how did it transition from building this team to, um, you know, even the thought of developing Skyslope? Well, I got it here. Here, this file right here. This is my file. This is this is literally 2009, a real file. So if I'm closing 300 homes a year, I have 300 files this big. So I'm in California. This is a California file. It's nuts in California. So not only did I have 300 files, but I had my own file. My transaction coordinator had her own file, and my assistant had her own file. Because guess what? We were all in different places. They liked it organized different than I did. I was a slop in my file, obviously, because I'm a real Trump going to one. So at the end of the year, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to probably save all three because we're not going to like figure out which one has what. We take three, put it in storage. I'm like, there's got to be a better way to, to do this. There's, it, it, I think it goes right back to when I was a realtor. I saw a problem. My realtor sucked. There was nothing out there that could help me. I got my real estate. Same thing here. I looked at every platform on the market. They were not great. They were not built from a real estate practitioner standpoint. I said, there's got to be a better way to do this. I have a lot of offers coming on my listings. I have a lot of buyers. Um, there's a lot of paperwork. Everything's a mess. Um, there's got to be a better way. And I don't want to carry this around. I mean, truly, do you remember the days where you used to carry like five or six of these? Or some people had them in, do you remember the dollies? People used to have dollies and they used to wheel them into the office. Like, that's crazy to think that that was seven, eight, nine years ago, not even five years ago. Some offices are still doing it, by the way, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. But um, you know what I mean? So the idea came from, I needed to use this for myself. And so I said, I can't find something out there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have something built just for me. It was actually, it wasn't even called Skyslip. It was called Smith, get this, Smith Premier Properties Portal, Inc.com. <laughs> that was literally my domain. I remember calling my mom like, I've got a domain and I'm going to create an internal back end system. She's like, what's the name? I'm like, so it has our name in it, mom. It's Smith premier properties portal, Inc. Got to throw the ink in there.com. She's like, 
it's long, but it's cool, son. I'm like, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I started to use it. And I used it and I said, okay, we need to change this. Okay, this would be great if this had this. My assistant would say, we need this. And eventually we said, okay, this is awesome. But my broker still needs me to print all this crap out. I was like, let's just build a simple way for the broker to review it. Done. So we built out something for my broker to review it. And he goes, this is awesome. How do we get all the agents on this? I'm like, well, I don't know, because I do business different. And, and I, this is how naive, and I didn't know about technology. I don't want them to see my business. And I don't, you know, I didn't know how that whole world worked um, back then. So eventually built out the broker side, allowed for our brokerage before I left and did my own gig. He allowed for our brokerage to, uh, to use it. They loved it. I'm like, well, what other companies would want to use this? So I called my buddy. So the way that I network, you know it. I knew Leo. I'm like, Leo, you're over in DC, dude. Who's your broker? I need them to try this software out. Hey, say Shell. Hey, Amy. Hey, Jacqueline. Like I call all my top producer buddies. I'm like, I got software. I think it's great. We're using it. I just want to get feedback. I won't even charge your broker, but they're going to love it. Started to use it. And trust me, realtors, and you should know this. You've got your own CRM now, gig, right? Realtors have feedback. My friend. They are very vocal. And so I learned real early what sucked, what didn't suck. And so we said, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna build this. This is something that's valuable. Um, you know, we're going to make this a nationwide company and um, we're gonna scale it. And I think this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a, a great saving. In the beginning, it was just, you can turn in your paperwork without having to come to the office, right? That was the idea of like, why do I need to come to the office to turn in paperwork and get paid? Like, you don't want to email, why can I upload it? And why do you have all this, stuff on your desk auditor auditing it was it was the simplest concept then obviously we do a lot more than just paper exchange right and exchanging paper um but that's where it started yeah it started because of this this nasty file which is a behemoth um of of, of, uh, of paper yeah it's it's so it's so insane how life works but you know it's just like you, you go out there and you solve your problems and you solve them on a high enough level then you know, eventually they're, they're solving everybody else's problems. So, man, so, okay. So you get to the point where, um, I mean, now you've got this amazing system and, and, you know, it's working well for you. You're, you're getting great feedback from your friends in the industry. Um, you still got your real estate team though, and you're growing your real estate business. You're growing this at what point, you know, what was that threshold like? And what was kind of like going on internally, you know, cause I'm sure that that was a hard, hard decision to know yeah. which way to go and, and is going one way or keeping yeah. need to focus on both. Like what was, what was happening at that point? Yeah. So Skyslope was established as a, a, an entity and a name, like a true business. We hired our first employee in 2011, 2012 and 2011 began in 2012. I still had my real estate business. We were still, that was a year we closed uh, 315 deals on my personal, my, my side of things. And then another like 600 with my listing coordinators and my buyer's agents. So right under a thousand, a total thousand deals did pretty well. And I was working real little. Um, I love work. So it's not like I was like relaxing. I was just managing it instead of working in my business, I was working on it. Um, and so when I was doing that, um, everything was working fine. And I was starting sky slow. There became a problem. Um, a couple of problems happened. One, we are still generating a lot of business, a lot of referrals, but our local market, you know, I have competition as a realtor. Everyone knows Tyler. I was the number one in Sacramento, number five in the nation at the time. So everyone in Sacramento knew me. And so we had a broker, a very large broker. And I said, I want you to buy our software. This is going to change it. And this would be a very big client, you know, a thousand, five hundred agents. And they said, well, here's the deal. If you want us to buy your software, our agents know you. And not that they don't like you, but you're their competition. And they think you're going to steal their leads. Now, that's a lot of Kanaga, right? Because when you think about it, the deal's already executed. The leads in the system, they're, they're closing a house. So what I mean, you call them and say, hey, Josh, I know you're under contract, but you should leave your, your, your agent and come over with me. And that's not real. So what happened was I said, okay, so the only thing holding you back what is my real estate business. 100%, you definitely have the best software. We looked at it. We vetted it. That's the holdup. Move your license over to our company. I said, that's not going to happen um, because I'm just – that's one problem, right? Now I'm gonna get the next person who's gonna say the same thing. You're with, uh, you know, Remax or Keller or whoever, and you need to move your license to us if you want us to buy your software. And I wanted, I was in the software game. I was, my head shifted. I want to, I want to build software. I want to change the brokerage, um, the brokerages on a technology perspective inside their office. And so I went to my buddy, 
um, who was number two, I said, hey, you're gonna buy my business and here's why you're gonna buy it and here's what you're gonna pay me and here's how much referrals I get every single month. My, here's my conversions on my referrals. Here's the systems and processes I have in place. You and I already talk because we're buddies. You know I run the tightest ship and I don't have any involvement at all. And he goes, you're a little, uh, you're, you're a little rich on the price. And I said, I, I guarantee you it will be the best decision you make you, these systems are in place. You couldn't pay a loan this much money from just the systems level of the referrals in the business. So I sold my business. A month later, she signed up. So it, it was a, a bittersweet moment because it was, I think, still think high school's my, uh, or, or real estate's my high school sweetheart. I, I really do think it is. It's like the one that just will never get away. I love real estate. I love realtors. I love the process. I love the, the, the peaks. I love the valleys. I love the wins. I love the lows. I just love it. It's the best business ever. Skyslope wouldn't be here without real estate that I, that I did so well. So um, I still think about it all the time. It's still, I still get clients who call me all the time. I'm like, I actually got to call this person, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's not me. I don't practice. But I still get, it's crazy amount of real estate referrals I still get by doing zero. Like, I mean, I stay in contact with people if I see them, but I'm not calling them. I'm not sending them voice notes or text messages. I'm not like, hey, how's, how's Johnny, you know? We're talking five years later. I'm still getting, I just got an $800,000 referral literally last week by doing nothing. $800,000. It was, it was nuts. So um, the transition was, I was, I wouldn't say forced. It was the right time um, to, to, to push on that business. And a lot, this is a, you know, our technology space at the time was pretty competitive. So people were like, well, he's still in real estate. You know, he's not really running the company. And you know, I was like, well, I'm running the company. That's all I'm doing. I'm not selling real estate. So it was just the right time and, and it was a, a, a great profit, you know? Yeah, yeah, love it, man. So then, um, yeah, I mean, talk to us, for those of you, I mean, we've got a lot of, a, a lot, a lot, a lot of realtors that listen to this, this podcast um, all throughout the country and, and Canada and really all over the place. Um, but kind of, kind of give us an idea. I mean, I, I've been using Skysoap uh, from the client, um, actually both my brokers that I've been with for, yep. you know, uh, um, I made a transition about two and a half years ago. And then the broker before that was a Skysoap client um, yep. as well. So we've been using it internally as a team for, I don't know, probably four or five years now. Wow. Um, and it's an amazing system. You know, those of you that are there, I mean, it, it, it's a game changer, dude. I, I remember, I remember dude, going to my, I, you know, with the storage, you know, when you're showing those files, I had a buddy with me. I'm like, I gotta stop by my storage unit. I gotta get this shit out of my car real quick. Just hold on one sec. So we pulled up my storage unit. It's like the biggest storage unit you could get. <laughs> you know, ceiling to ceiling, you know, cause we're doing, you know, high volume at that point. We gotta store these things for five years. And my buddy would go to my storage unit. He goes, man, dude, if, if uh, anybody ever is awarded your storage unit on storage <laughs> units, man, we're gonna be so pissed, bro. We're gonna be <laughs> so mad, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was the point where, like, I literally had to 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 pay one of those shred companies to bring the semi out to shred it once once we hit that five year mark. It was insane. You did it. It, it, so so kind of walk us through and, and give those of that maybe aren't a current sky so client um, an idea of what the software is, what the features are, how it helps brokers, how it helps agents. Yeah, so SkySlope's a, a software that uh, we only sell directly to the broker. So right now we service over twenty five hundred brokers. Uh, we have 41 of the top 100 brokers in the nation, so we do very well with anyone from a boutique brokerage all the way up to you know agents, uh, you know brokers that have nine to ten thousand agents. Um, what it does is it helps real estate agents and admins manage their transaction online. So instead of carrying around and doing all of this, which sounds weird in the 2017 world, it still does happen. Um, but all the way from submitting your paperwork, filling out your forms, negotiating, utilizing our digital signature. Um, all the way to post-closing services. So like when HUD season's around or tax season's around the following year, sending out your HUD, we, we manage the entire transaction online. And um, yeah, we've got about 160,000 subscribers in all 50 states. Um, so Barry's still, I think it's still day one, very small compared to how big the landscape is. Um, today, still today, our biggest competitor is paper. Um, believe it or not, a lot of brokers are still utilizing paper or they're somewhat paperless using kind of a Dropbox, a zip forms, all this. We take it and put it all into one, uh, one cubby and uh, allow for, for brokerages to run their back office and agents to manage a transaction. 
Yeah, no, those of you that are that are watching, listen. Maybe if you're an agent, not a broker, um, you know how, how it helps. You know, because obviously I'm an agent, I'm not a broker, so you know my broker provides the software. But if you whether you have a team or not, you know, right? But when you, especially once you have that team format, um, it's so powerful, right? Because anybody in my team, listing coordinator, transaction coordinator, any agents, whatever, everybody can access from anywhere on the planet. Get the information they need. It's organized. It, it, it's I mean, I don't know. I, I don't, it would be interesting. I don't know if you track this and, and maybe in your own business you did when you were creating it for yourself, but the amount of hours it saves you per touching that file compared to going with, you know, a paper system. Yeah, we, we used to, so it's funny you say that. So back in the day, so you have to think, when we first did this, people were like, the thought of going paperless is like, no one could, it's kind of like the thought of going on Facebook. Remember our very first time, Everyone's like, you're gonna be on Facebook. Like, I'm never gonna be on this or Snapchat. I'm never gonna be on Snapchat. Like, all these people, everyone says this. I'm never gonna be paperless. What do you mean? It's so simple. I I, I hold it. I'm a, I I like to touch it. It's it's crazy. That's called the evolution of of humans. So we used to track the hours. Now we don't even track the hours. What we do is we track for us. We say well, our goal is we want we, Josh. We don't want you in our platform all day long. We don't. We want you to get in and get out so you can do the most efficient thing, which is prospecting or on a beach drinking a, a, a pina colada. I don't know, something, right? So what we now track is this: it takes this much time from the moment you put a listing or a sale on our platform to the moment it's done. How do we get that down by 10x, right? So you're bringing me back to like 2000 circa 12 of how long, how much time did it save paper for a realtor? A lot of time. We're now saying, how do we take it already efficient and how do we literally make it 10 times faster, um, 10 times less clicking? Ten to, how do we do all this automation in the background where, Josh, I don't want you to think. I want you to actually go out and do what you do and let us, with the technology because it's there, understand what we're doing with the documents and process them in the background where you don't have to do anything. You follow me? Yeah. So um, I, I'd have to get that number. I can tell you it's a lot because that's what that was our original value prop of. Hey, brokers, you know, you have three admins doing this. You could have one admin doing it and you're going to be more compliant. Hey, agents, you now just in driving, if you remember driving or faxing and waiting for the fax, and it's hard to think about that, people still fax. It's crazy. They do. And you might see because you, you, you're in the business more than I am, but I can tell you we see it because we have a fax feature and our bill, we pay for faxing because agents still fax out of our system. Um, it's still available. It's crazy. So, uh, yeah, man, it's been a fun journey. We've got, you know, about a hundred employees now, um, here downtown Sacramento. We're hiring. We just had to open up a couple new divisions. Um, so we'll probably double, double in size this time, you know, 12, 13 months from now. Um, but yeah, it's been real fun. Yeah. That's amazing, man. And, and, uh, you know, one thing that agents don't, a lot of agents don't do, but, you know, calculating their, their time per hour on different activities. And, you know, when you're talking about saving things 10 X from even where you are right now, compared to what it was with the paper system. I mean, if an agent's making three fifty on the phones prospecting and, you know, they find themselves doing $15 activities. Yep. Um, I mean, it, it's just, it comes down to effectiveness and efficiency. It, it, like you said too, the amount of staff, I mean, in 2012, which I think it was about roughly the year that you and I met. Um, I mean, I had, double or triple the amount of staff doing half the deals, you know, right? I mean, technology has just changed the game. You know, people think that, you know, governments or the president, uh, uh, you know, has this massive impact on, on unemployment. I'm like, dude, it's technology, man. And, and but it's great systems like yours, dude, that allow us just to, to be able to do that. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's real fun. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it, I think what, what you'll see come in the next, you know, two years, not just with SkySlip, but just technology in general, it, it's, Think about how fast it's moving and, and what capabilities there are. I'm telling you, it, it, it's nuts. And to be to take advantage of, I tell realtors all the time, is take advantage of everything right now. Be first, have first movers advantage on everyone. Try things, you know, do them. There's so much money to be had. And what they do is they just gotta think about it. average age, it went down. It was 57, average age, average realtor is 57 ounce, 54. That's what they say the average is. We'll see in six months, I think it'll continue to go down. But what happens is Everyone's so afraid to, to try it. And then what happens is they're forced to try it because it's the new standard, it's the new normal, right? And so one, audit your time, like you said, but two, try things out. Be open to change. Skyslip, we have something on our wall, we say change is our strength. We change a lot, we change daily. And with how fast technology is changing, 
you're either going to change or you're going to get changed. It's just going to happen because it's the evolution of, of, of the world, right? And so, um, yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. I, I get to wake up every day and, and try to improve the lives of, of realtors and brokers and admins um, through technology. And uh, it's, it's a real fun. Yeah. yeah. You, you guys see yourself ever making the transition to, I know you're, you're, you just sell the brokers, but you see yourself, like if somebody's with a broker that's stuck on some old archaic system or just won't, you know, doesn't, for whatever reason, won't invest into it. You know, do you see yourself ever uh, uh, kind of creating an, an agent portal platform of it? So yes and no. So it, it's real tough. We thought about that. We actually had that model in the beginning um, and we completely stripped it away from it because we said, okay, Josh, you're an agent, let's just say, and you use Skyslow, but your broker says, well, Josh, you still need to print it out. So one could argue and say, well, Tyler, you're still providing software, great software for Josh. Yes, we are. But unless they connect, we believe that there's still a lot of work for the broker uh, or for the agent to get it to the broker. Yeah. Um, and so one, brokerages should be paperless. If, if, if a broker is still using paper like this, it's crazy. Um, and they're out there, but it's crazy. You know, and so one, I think they need to make sure they're, they're, they're with, you know, the truly the right broker, but we probably won't. We just opened up a, a transaction coordinating, um, uh, which is called Sky TC. What we found is um, a lot of people are asking because we have great support. Hey, do you, you know, do you guys have a recommendations to, to, to transaction coordinators? Mine's not great. We surveyed our agents. They're not great. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, a lot of them. So we created something uh, in, internally. And um, it's our fastest growing department. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be great. So that's what we're doing is we're selling directly to the agents on that perspective. Um, and uh, we're, we're better, we're faster, and in most cases, we're cheaper. And we'll be able to drive that margin down to a very small margin um, for a very small cost, excuse me, um, for the agents once we power it with technology. So a lot of the stuff that we do is repetitive. Like, think about it. I represent you as a buyer, it goes into contract. What do I do? I gotta turn my paperwork to the broker. What then do I have to do? I have to schedule everything. Contingencies on appraisal, contingencies on inspections. You know, what's the close date? I gotta open up escrow. I mean, it's, it's the same thing over and over. And so our goal is how do we create not only a great experience and service, but how do we power with technology so uh, it actually outperforms the human of a transaction coordinator, right? So we're going to build a national transaction coding company and we, we started already and it's a, uh, it's our fastest growing department. So that's the only thing I think we'll ever sell to an agent. Um, I don't think we'll sell the software um, just because the broker still, the broker, you have to understand the agents use our software because the broker needs to check it off in order to get paid. And obviously there's a lot more that it does, but let's just break that down. Right? So an agent, they don't have to turn to the broker. They have to find a crazy value. And I think you guys find value whether your broker uses it or not, but it's an easier sell to the broker when they say it's a man, it's mandatory for our brokerage and it's the new standard for their company in order to run. Yeah. Love it, man. So um, if somebody's listening to this, whether they're a broker owner, maybe they're an agent and their broker's not using it and they, they want to inform their broker, John, and, and I, those of you watching, listen, I highly recommend that you guys do again. I mean, I, I'm a, a uh, it's not just because Tyler's on the podcast. I mean, I've been a personal client and a personal user of this system for a lot of years, and I can't imagine uh, real estate today without it. So, um, where Tyler, where's the best place for them to learn more information about it and pass that information on to the broker? Um, uh, where's the best place to go to do, do that? Yeah, I mean, they can go, there are a couple of ways. They can go to skyslope.com, um, and it has all the information. I would tell you, the broker, I mean, here's the deal we're, we're we are in 2017, and um, we have what we call training wheels, and then we have our robust platform. And it starts with the training wheels platform, right? Like, let's get you on the platform. Let's allow for agents to use a mobile app, our digital signature, and, and upload documents to their broker where they can accept or reject them. Because right now what's happening is they're emailing back and forth, and the broker's really not compliant. Um, so going to skyslip.com, you, you should send them there. You can also go to tylersmith.com. gives a little background on, on, on other things of uh, from not only from the, 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 the software side of things, but also allowing them to, to, to see the story of Skyslope and some of the other tools that we provide to, to realtors and brokers um, through our technology. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So um, just a couple last questions for you, because I know you're a busy man and your time is very valuable, but uh, you know, uh, when, again, when it comes to you personally, man, and, and I don't know if, you know, there's always rumors out there about certain things, but you know, I've heard, uh, uh, 
you know, some big offers thrown your way and, and things where you could just be done, you know, right? Done and not just done, but done living the life and just peace out at 32 years old or however young you are. What, what personally keeps you leveling up and driving and striving for greatness and not letting the whole good enough um, settle in um, when you could easily at this point just cash out and, and, and be done? Like yeah. What keeps you internally driving? Um, I, for me, I, I think it's, I like to say, I have this philosophy, it's, it's, it's so early still, it's day one. But I, I think I'm the luckiest person to be alive in this era. And I mean, the era of technology, I'm obsessed with technology. Um, and I think it's just because there's so many things that are inefficient that I just even recognize in my own life that technology can fix that. I'm hungry. I mean, I'm just hungry. Yeah. So can we sell and make money? Great. I, this is a long-term business, just like my real estate business was. It's a very long-term relation business. And our, I, our, our, when we have long-term thinking, we get to invent on behalf of the customer. And when we invent on behalf of the customer and not be competitor obsessed, but we're truly customer obsessed, we outperform and we win, right? We listen to our users and, and we don't have enough users. I want more, right? I want to listen to them. I want to build the future. I want them to be safe so that they don't look at technology as something that can, that can remove commissions, right? Or, or, or devalue the realtor, but where it can show more value for the realtor because they can work faster, they can provide more services and value. And so I, I'm just hungry, man. It's just, I think that's what it is. It's just, it's still day one. It's still early. And I've been doing this since 2011. It's still day one. And next year, you'll hear me say the same thing. It's still early. We're, we're, we're just getting started. Technology is, is, is a baby. These are the previews. What you see with the Amazons and what you see with the, the Facebooks, it's a preview to what the world looks like. Like everyone's like, this is crazy. I can press a button and toilet paper comes 20 minutes later from Amazon. Guys, that's the preview. That's like literally that's the preview of what's happening. And I am obsessed with finding ways of taking that and how do we make it for realtors and real estate brokerages to really show them what our preview is. Um, it's just, it's too early. It's too early to, 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 to go out, way too early. Yeah, no, I love it, man. Powerful stuff, dude. So those that are watching and listening, man, they're, they're here watching and listening to this podcast because they want to go out there and create their own, you know, amazing epic lives for themselves, you know, just like you've been able to do. And, and do you have any last words of maybe advice or inspiration that you'd like to leave them with so they can do exactly that? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to, I think this is the, the, the thing that changed my life the most is going back to what you really want, right? What is the why? You wanna make a million bucks? Cool, you know, you want, you know, you wanna take four months out of a year off and go travel with your family? Awesome, you know, you just wanna work and you don't know what you wanna do? Cool, that's great as well, but I, I was very clear early on in my why and I wanted to be number one, that was it. And when I became number one in my area, then I was like, okay, well, that's, not, that's over, right? But what I really want, okay, I really wanna create an experience for my, my clients. Um, when I was in real estate. So I, you know, I want to be able to never have to think about money again. Back then that was my dream. You know, so you have all these true whys. I think it starts there because everything is fun um, and, and great, but if you don't have a true purpose for doing it um, or a true meaning for doing it, it's, it's going to be stay, it's going to be hard to stay on course, right? When you truly know what that North star is and you're constantly tracking there, knowing that I maybe took one step and it's tough and I wish I could have, taking 20 steps, but it's one step. As long as you know you're moving in a direction of what your big reason and why is, man, the sky's the limit. That's, it's powerful, right? Because you know that everything you do should be going towards that North Star. The problem is people are doing things and they don't have that vision or that North Star or their why. And their why can be easy. I want to buy a new car, right? I want to get out of $10,000 worth of debt. Like it, it doesn't have to be some, I want to fly a man to the moon, right? Or a woman to the moon. It doesn't have to be that. It's what is that true why? It's a dream. And then you need to put a deadline on it because I think that's called a goal. So a goal is a dream with a deadline. And then you strive towards it and you make daily progress towards it. And you're going to have days where you, you lose. Um, and they're going to have days where you win. But as long as you're winning more days than you're losing, right, you're winning, right? You can't win every day. You can't. I mean, I've never seen a basketball team win every single game. Close to it, but not every, right? And so what you have to do is you have to think, what am I doing today that's getting me towards that goal? And sometimes I will be the first to admit, guys, and I'm, I'm with you. Sometimes at the end of the day, I'd sit down after work and I'd go, nothing, right? I mean, God, I had five fires today. 
uh, a fence fell down. I had to do this. My client was calling. I had to take it. Great. Sometimes it's nothing, and that's tough. But what you got to do is you got to get refocused, look back at why you wanted this and why you're fighting so hard for it, and go back on the wagon the next day, right? And so I think that's the, 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 what I would tell people. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, the other thing is maybe just I think people get very, uh, very easily bought into shiny objects, the quick fix, the six-second abs. Uh, I can't still find my abs, right? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's true. Um, and, and it's easy to do that, right? It's easy to get fall for that. And it is, I've done it. I just say, you know, truly go back to your core. It's easy to do certain things. No one wants to do the hard work and they go, Oh, Tyler, I want to have a thousand. I want to do that. I'm going to go do this. I, you have to do the work. I was obsessed with my 35 items. People are like, you're nuts. You're right. I was crazy about it. I made everyone do them. I lived by them. I will die one day and I'll say he was known for the 35 things he did for buyers and sellers. It's what I stood for because I knew what it did for the promised land for me, right? And so I think, you know, not getting caught up in the, uh, the, 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 the shiny syndrome, you know, the shiny ob object syndrome, you know, getting really, really stuck on that. I guess that's all I can, that would be my advice to people. Find a why. And that why should keep you on course, not fall in love with the next quick fix. Cause I don't know about you, man. I just, I, I've never seen a quick fix in real estate. I still don't today. If I could create it, I would, if it was a pill, I would sell the shit out of it. It just, I just, I, I can't, I can't find it. And I search and I look, there's no, it's, it's hard work. There's no quick fix. Right. Yeah. The, the only magic pill that exists is consistency, man. 100%. So I couldn't agree more, brother. Powerful words, man. And those that are watching and listening, I know I end every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation today truly is the start of delusion. Information is no longer power. It's taking massive action on that information that you learn that creates that power in your world. And Tyler shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you today. Take something that you learn, take immediate action on it, go out there and create that, uh, that life you know you want and deserve. And you guys... Whether you're listening on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the website, wherever you're at, there's going to be some links below to go check out Sky Slope, um, learn more about Tyler, the, the whole story, all of that's there. So make sure to take immediate action on it. If you're an agent, not with your brokerage, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you share this podcast with your broker um, and make sure that you share those links with your broker too, because it's an absolute game changer, you guys. I can tell you from personal experience, it's going to change your career absolutely. And Tyler, man, I know how busy you are, dude. This has been a massive honor having the show, my friend. That was fun, man. Great to reconnect. It was, uh, it was real fun. Thank you. Yeah, 100%, my friend. All right, you guys, we will see you next time. Peace. Thanks.